Good evening, everyone. I am so excited for tonight's show. And um, before I get started, I just want to say if you like what you see, please hit that subscribe uh, button, hit the bell, share, comment. We really want to have as much interaction as we can in the chat tonight because we have a really great show. I hope everybody had a great Halloween weekend. But without further ado, I want to go ahead and get it, get us started and introduce our guests. So the first one I want to introduce is Dr. Dr. Daryl Ray. He is um, a psychologist who focuses on topics like organizational culture, secular sexuality, uh, the treatment of religion-induced trauma. He's a public speaker, podcaster, atheist activist, and he founded Recovering from Religion as well as the Secular Therapy Project, both of which are nonprofit organizations. Welcome, Dr. Ray. Good to be here. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I am too. I think it's going to be wonderful. The next person I want to introduce is Scientist Mel. She's a scientist and educator with a BS in bio and chem and a master's as well as a YouTube content creator. She has a live stream science show that's extremely interactive with her audience where topics are viewer generated and voted on. Um, she has planned guests and content even for older audiences. Welcome, Scientist Mel. Thanks for having me again. I've, I've had a great time being on your channel. I am so happy to have you back. I've, I've really been looking forward to having you back on. All right. And not uh, least at all, but last, I'm going to introduce to you Greg Ladden. And I hope I'm saying your last name right. Is it Ladden? It's Layden. Layden. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me, Greg Layden. He's a former professor who is now writing and advising um, activist groups and candidates on policy. He taught at Harvard as a professor of biological anthropology and then taught at the University of Minnesota. So we have a very distinguished panel here today. And today our topic is all about love, where it comes from, what is it, and why is it important to our lives? I also kind of want to touch on the difference between, or is there a difference between secular love and theocratic love? I thought that might be a little interesting twist there. So um, I'm ready to, to jump on in with that. So let's just start it off with what is love for anyone maybe who don't wants hurt to start. Me. Don't yeah, hurt me no more. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's good. We actually 90s. were talking. Yes, yeah, that's the 90s. And then we were talking actually the 80s is more with, um, uh, oh my God, who were we talking about earlier, Dr. Ray? Um, Tina, Tina, Turner. Tina Turner. What's, got, what's love got to do with it? Oh, we should have that song on. Yeah. yeah. There's all kinds of really good songs. Mm. What does love have to do with it? So why why are we interested as human beings in this topic of love? What is it? That's a question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> let's see. Well, some would say it's um, biochemical reactions that you have, neurotransmitters that can affect your entire body when you have visual stimulus hit you. Um, others might say there's evolutionary benefits, you know, benefits to having love. So you have a person with you so you can procreate. Um, there's whole psychological aspects of love and needing to have that reciprocated. Um, so which channel do we want to go down? <laughs> I, as many as we can do in the time that we have, actually. <laughs> I think that's a, a really great answer. Do you, uh, Daryl or Greg, have anything to add to that? Well, I can add something, I think. Um, that's a good description of the framework of the problem. One thing I think, I'm a biological anthropologist, and I often am engaged in the process of thinking about humans as animals. And the, the two mistakes we people make when we think about ourselves are first thinking about ourselves as completely unique and special and not like other animals. Um, now, that's actually a correct view of humans because if we were just like some other animal, we would be that species. Every species is unique in its own way. But since Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and others pointed out that we're just a mere speck in the universe and all that, I think we get the idea that we shouldn't be making exceptional arguments about ourselves, okay? Uh, on the same, at the same time, so we are, we are like scientist Mel has pointed out, 
the these hormonal and endocrine and limbic processes have to be considered and thought about when you talk about something like love or any emotion. That's the emotion organ. You've got to understand it from the point of view of that organ at some level. But at the same time, we are not like every other ape in some really important ways. And there are ways that we often don't even notice or it don't, don't get into the conversation. For example, the way Richard Ranga puts it, and I worked a lot with Ranga, he's a chimpanzee guy, is that um, human males, the way he says it, I'm not, uh, so I'm, I will not defend his exact wording. The way he says it, that human males are always sexually interested in human females. By that, what he means is um, there is a there is an ongoing sexual interest on the part of in a heterosexual model uh, is an ongoing sexual interest by human males. And he says this as an insight, because when he looks at chimpanzees, he sees chimpanzee males as being utterly and totally uninterested in all female chimpanzees unless they're in estrus. Huh. So if a chimpanzee is not showing estrus, it is not of interest, that individual. And this is true across primates, most primates. And some people call it hidden estrus in humans. That a, a male, a human male has a dilemma where you can't tell if a female is ovulating. And if we were normal primates, you could tell when a female is ovulating, then you can tell whether it's worth ripping apart some other primate with your canines or something over that female. <laughs> so that, <laughs> when you think about it, that problem actually kind of explains a lot about human relationships and interactions. Yeah. It also kind I of think, puts forward in it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the whole thing in asterisks is like a whole separate conversation could be had on consent with that too. But I'm sorry. Yeah. I, that was just a random thought. Dr. Dr. Ray. I, I, I just think hidden asterisks, uh, Greg, I totally agree with you, is, <laughs> the, is the key secret in many ways to uh, who we are as humans. And there's only like five species on the planet that have hidden asterisks. So it's very unique. It's very unusual. And it, it really does define our ability to, to have sexual attractiveness throughout throughout time, not just at a yeah. given time. And, and that drives a lot, of, a lot of other behavior, of course. Well, I wonder, though, is sexual drive and sexual attraction and copulation the same as love? Or is it different? I honestly think it's, it's different. You can have various types of love. Um, we do have people who are asexual and they can fall in love. Um, love is a, if you look at it from like a hormonal or neurotransmitter stand, standpoint, it's affected by slightly different hormones. Now they do like play a role in the other stuff, but the attachment and stuff like that is primarily driven, I believe, by oxytocin. Um, and then you have like the lust that's driven by estrogen and testosterone and things like that. But the, the, the sheer fact that we have people that have no sexual drive, but do fall in love. I mean, that kind of plays a role there. Um, mm -hmm. You have various kinds of love. So I think you can have love without having lust. Yeah. I would agree. They're different. They're very much overlapping topics, but they are either one of those things is made up of numerous different parts that are not all put together the same way every time. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder I think, oh, I go ahead. The, the the notion that the, the the whole notion of love itself is just it's just a cultural construct and different cultures construct it differently. There's so much I look at this as more I don't know, concentric circles or, or, or Venn diagrams. I'm, I'm, I don't want a hierarchy. I'll, I'll hierarchy it, so to speak. But, you know, you can start where, where Mel did with, with the neurotransmitters and you can in, start there and then move out and out and out until you get to the, the, the social construct of love. And every one of them is uh, important. Uh, like Greg said, it, every one of these, whether they're a Venn diagram that overlap, for some people, it overlaps completely. In other places, it doesn't overlap at all. And if we come at it from that direction, it's it's an enormous topic. But there's not any one definition for it. I'm I don't even like using the word love myself. And when you told, invited me to come here, I thought um, I'm going to argue that we shouldn't even use the word. Oftentimes, <laughs> it's other things. There's other ways to describe it. But go ahead. I'll 
I'll oh, save I, that argument later. <laughs> I think that's fascinating, though. I, 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 what I'm just curious, what would you use instead of the word love? I'd be more specific. I think there's attachment. I think there's partnering. I think there's different levels of relationship. And we just kind of clump them all into love. Uh, for example, here's, an, here's another uh, parallel, the notion of jealousy. Jealousy has, is really quite a gigantic idea, but if you break it down into its component parts, it's much more understandable. Jealousy is, is somebody being possessive. Somebody's uh, afraid of, uh, afraid of betrayal. I mean, there's a lot of components that go into jealousy. And so I advocate oftentimes to get rid of the word jealousy. Let's define what this is. Is it fear of abandonment and fear of abandonment is one component that's really important to some people. Well, look at the other way as love. A ta need for attachment is kind of like the uh, flip side of fear of abandonment. And let's let's look at love as at least in some component of that is related to attachment. So be more specific and stop throwing this <laughs> one word at a gigantic problem. I, I, that's my that's my opinion anyway. Well, fortunately, this is not the hollow the um, this is the Halloween episode. And not the Valentine's Day episode because <laughs> love is scary too. It's scary, and otherwise we have to be a lot more holidays. I, I, I don't know what said, but we might need a lot an attachment holiday and a you know fear. Yeah, of that's that's true. Only this holiday. And... I I think I wanted to kind of piggyback on the jealousy thing. I also um, I've had friends that have been in non-monogamous types of relationships, and they've been highly successful um, with that sort of thing. Uh, and there's there's just various aspects of that, you know, how involved are they with the attachment and stuff like that. But oftentimes with what I've seen with them, jealousy tends to also stem from not having needs met. So um, that's part of kind of what I've seen with some of those circles. If they take on too many people in their particular circle, then how are you going to meet all of those needs of attachment and <laughs> physical and things like that? Because each person is different and each one is like a different country. So <laughs> relationships are kind of the same thing. Over here we have France. Here we have Uruguay. <laughs> here we have America. Back there we got the UK. So and they each have different rules and different expectations. Um so, yeah, it's a complicated thing, in, in my opinion. It is. And that kind of brings up the uh, a, a topic that uh, I think we should we should at least recognize that. that um, and I could be wrong on this, but I feel like uh, over time, the younger generation and each generation that that comes after is trying harder and harder to be healthier in these types of relationships. They're recognizing and accepting these different types of attachments or relationships and trying to find a healthier way to be. And uh, whereas before it was man and a woman for life, don't divorce, doesn't matter if it's abusive, all of those things don't matter. You just, you know, you make that attachment when you're 16, 17, 18, and then that's what you do, not recognizing that your brain changes. Your brain is not fully developed at those ages and your brain changes and people's needs change, uh, which also then goes into some of the theocratic ideas that have kind of hindered us for so long. Uh, but do you feel like our younger generation or each generation after the next tends to look for healthier and healthier ways to engage in these types of things? Or is it just that it feels that way in the moment, if that makes sense. Do you feel that there's any type of change or growth or movement towards healthy? If you base it on song lyrics, then no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me there. I, I, throw, I throw it down, I throw it away. <laughs> but but it, it, anyway, change over time is interesting. There's a big picture here, which is how, what is a normal, you know, if you go to go to look at a culture and say, what is the normal meaning, most typical mm -hmm. set of ways people relate to each other and as relationships, whether they're friendships mm -hmm. or sexual relationships, whatever, what is the list of things that people do 
that everyone else knows about and it's considered just what you do. Um, and you would expect that if you went from culture to culture, you'd find increasing variation as you went added cultures to your list. You'd also expect if you go back in time and look at historical records, you'd see people being different over time. And that's, I think, a real, that's a less studied than it should be. It has been studied, less studied than it should be. One of the problems of looking at a broad ethnographic case is the ethnographic observations of various cultures were either tainted because they weren't scientific ethnographies or they were preceded by missionaries or explorers who changed the way people were by statute sometimes. So you, you have, we have a description of how people live. The most exotic culture is probably something like you know, Madagascar in the 12th century. And is it like one person wrote down what people were doing? It's just not good data. Um, but we also have the other interesting data of the private one-on-one -on -one sexual behavior surveys, which Daryl's probably more familiar with anyone else, but like the Heights survey and the Masters mm -hmm. and Johnson surveys. What's really interesting about those surveys is that they show utterly different, dramatically different, astoundingly different practices. Every time you look, at Americans and ask, what do you do in private? It's utterly different. It's like people, it's, it's untethered to any consistency. And that oh. to me shows something about where that this whole topic is, has a, has a, has a framework that on the outside of it that looks a lot more consistent than it really is. Totally agree, yeah. That goes into the social, cultural type aspects versus the personal preference type thing. And you were talking about the, uh, the cultural aspect of that earlier. So Daryl, uh, would you like to expound upon that? I think that's a great point. Well, uh, I have been kind of back to your question about is our people, or is there a new ethos around love and sexuality? I, I think there may be, I'm, I'm seeing, I, I'm kind of in the middle of the, of it all. So I, I'm get, I've got a good perspective. I can see what's happening and places that aren't obvious, I don't think. Uh, one of which was, for example, back in 2012, we did a, a survey of, of 14,950 uh, atheists about their sex lives. And uh, it's available on, on um, you can just download it, download the report, a 48-page report on everything we found. I mean, how many times did you get 48, uh, 15,000 plus people answer questions about their most intimate um, ideas about sex? <laughs> it was very, very revealing <laughs> and what, what we found was um, a lot of difference in people's sexual behavior based upon their religious upbringing uh, with, uh, and, you know, as you would expect, that's kind of what we were looking for. So I'm, I'm just putting all that to preface, preface all that to say that I personally have been polyamorous now for 25 years and it, it fits me better than any other approach I've ever had to relationships. And it seems it works well for me. And I know it works well for some other people. But here's the catch. And Mel, I think this is part of what you're asking or what you're addressing was there's a, there's a certain portion of people trying it that shouldn't probably be trying it. <laughs> because yes. it's, it's, it's trying to meet a need that they haven't even identified yet. And they don't know how to ma manage it. I mean, it's got, I see a lot of tumult, tumult and drama among people trying to um, engage in some kind of a polyamorous or non-monogamy, but ethical non-monogamy. So I, and I think that's new in our system. We, nobody was talking about that 20, 20 or five or 30 years ago until the ethical slut. Well, until 1988, when, when loving more came out with Dr. Deborah Annapol. But before that, nobody was talking about it unless you consider Robert Heinlein's book, stranger in a strange land, which is kind of patriarchal in it's polyamorous approach. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's like anyway. big love on HBO, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A little bit like that. Yeah. I don't think that's ethical non-monogamy though. I think that's no, I don't, religious. I don't think so either, but I don't know that I'd hate having my own house just so long as I <laughs> yeah. could have other partners too. Yeah. Well, that, I don't think they allow that there. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question or not, Sonny, but I, uh, that's that's my yeah, it, it absolutely did i mean as you guys were all talking about those things something that that mel said earlier struck me uh first of all what you were just saying about um people not really understanding or understanding themselves 
let alone another person. Because a lot of times it's a younger person who, like we said before, their brain hasn't even fully developed yet. They don't really know fully who they are, let alone who anyone else is. And they might be engaging in uh, in things because it's kind of the buzzword in a sense. And they're just kind of exploring. And that's fine. It's fine to explore and to learn. That's what our young adult youth part is about, is kind of figuring those things out. But it can also be unhealthy if you don't uh, recognize that you are not necessarily able, fully able to engage in it 100%. You're kind of putting a toe in the water and just to recognize that. But in, but what that also touches on is what you said, Mel, about consent. And I think that's a big thing that we are focusing on more and more mm-hmm. um, is what exactly is consent? Not just uh, feigned consent, but enthusiastic, informed consent. And what does that mean? Because a lot of times in all of our interactions, we all have a give and take. So we don't always enthusiastically consent to anything, Um, you know, whether it's going to work because you really don't want to get up in the morning, but you do it anyway, to having to deal with someone you don't much care about, but you have to, or you don't much like, you don't get along really well, but you have to. And so you're nice down to the little nuances of what happens in a relationship, in an intimate relationship. And those times when you consent, even though you're not enthusiastic about it. And what, where's the line? What, you know, what's that line that you draw? So I think uh, as you guys were talking, all of those thoughts are going on in my, in my head. And then what that means when it comes to love, that big word that we said, maybe we shouldn't be using anymore, but I don't know right now in this context, what else to use? Cause it is attachment, but there's a lot of other things too. So what do you guys think about that? I'll start with Mel first, because you had brought up the idea of, or the topic of consent. Um, that's where communication is so very important. If you're in a long-term relationship, hopefully you feel comfortable enough to talking with your partner about what you like and what you don't like, but there's a stigma associated with women enjoying sex (laughs) and being vocal about it. Um, I've gotten to a point where I don't really just like, Hey, you know, I'm not wearing underwear tonight. You know, I don't do that. I'm just like, do you want to go and do the deed? (laughs) I just started, this is what I'd like to do this evening. And then, but not everybody (laughs) is that way. Uh, And I think a a lot of the issues we have is the stigma associated with women are not supposed to enjoy sex. And if they talk like that, then they've probably had too many partners. And so in the back of my mind as a woman trying to get across that I'm interested in these things, I try to do it in a way like, hey, it's natural sex, you know, (laughs) like we enjoy it, you know. Um, But making certain your partner understands what you like and what you don't like, what's okay, what's not okay. And sometimes you just got to sit down and fill out a list. Where am I today? I like this. I don't like that. Okay, great. I like this. Oh, fantastic. And then when you go and do the deed, you already worked all that out. So, But that's me. And you don't have to have the enthusiastic consent unless that's really part of your personality, but that communication is so important and it needs to go both ways, whoever your partner is and whoever you are. And if there's any breach in that, you stop immediately and you go, I'm sorry. I thought you enjoyed this. I apologize. We need, you know, and then just have a talk, then go back to sexy times, but it's not always that simple. Right. And understanding that you can, like something sometimes, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean you like it all the time. Yes. You may not want to do certain things because of biological things happening to you. Maybe you just don't feel so great because you had a lot of Taco Bell. So maybe we're not going to do that one thing <laughs> that we really enjoy normally. So, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> so best to say that on the front. End, otherwise, you both get surprised. <laughs> yeah, not in a good way either. <laughs> the the images that just came into my head are, are things I'm going to have sorry. to go to therapy for now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry for that. I was trying to, to be comical at the same time. Thank you, were. 
sounds perfect. Uh, so, Greg, do you have anything to add to that piece of the discussion? Well, I, I'm going to go anthropological again and broaden a little bit and look sort of cross-culturally. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at this, but the very simple version of it is that um, power relations between men and women are fundamental to whether or not consent is even considered as a thing that you can have. And there's lots of cultures where consent is very even between people in those cultures. They tend to be cultures in which there are not, in which men have not managed to accumulate large amounts of power and it's more shared. So the people that I worked with in, in, in the Central Africa, the F.A. Pygmies, for example, have, um, uh, there's times when men are definitely in charge. There's times when women are definitely in charge. And it depends upon what's going on that time of year. So on average, they're pretty even. Um, there's two groups I'll just mention of hunter-gatherer groups. One, they both live in rainforests. They both have very similar ecologies. And in one group, the uh, degree of monogamy is probably extremely high. And the degree of sexual jealousy is extremely high with both sexes. And the other group, there's virtually no parent jealousy. Paternity in one in the first group is almost always known and accurately attributed probably. And the second group is kind of a not really something people even are concerned about. And so in terms of consent, there is mo more or less not, are we going to have sex, but rather with whom people will be having sex in, in or out of a relationship. And I think what I think is going on with those two groups, which are otherwise very similar, so biologically, you'd expect them to be the same. It never works that way. Is because in a given culture, one set of rules works or another set of rules works. And I think that's what we're seeing in our culture. This is where the anthropology comes back. And we look at ourselves where our culture, whatever the heck that is, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the cross-cultural sample is Americans for European countries in Japan, right? If you can prove something is true in all those, it means it's a human universal. Um, <laughs> And, you know, in, in our culture, which is the last few decades and, you know, whatever, um, there's a lot of variation. People are coming at this from different places and there isn't. So, I, I again, going back to popular culture, um, I just uh, a couple of years ago, I decided for some reason to watch the first James Bond movie. I mean, I had probably seen it when I was a kid and I would be asleep, supposedly asleep in the back of the station wagon at the drive in. And I hadn't seen it since then. And the opening scene is a rape scene. And it's not a rape scene. It's like everything's fine that this is happening. This is normal. This guy's really cool, in fact. But it's a rape scene. And I think if you if you had the same exact script, the same exact series of events today in a movie, nobody would think of making that scene. A perfectly normal sexual interaction, which is a rape scene where the hero rapes the other protagonist, would not be a scene in a movie or a book anyone in our culture would write today. But, and then it was, he's cool. And, you know, we all, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know completely already, but we are living in a society right now where all those elements of culture exist right now down the street from where you are sitting. Yeah. Right now. And, um, and, and among the young people we're talking about, I think there's a lot less variation in among them, but not among their families. And, and the context in which they're struggling to exist. So another struggle then is if you're in a culture, a subculture where your family is James Bond, 1962, and you're in middle school in a, an American suburb, then you are experiencing a serious conflict in your life. You know, and that's what, that's what I worry about with, with what's happening now, like in our, you know, in our society. That's such a great point. And I think, Daryl, you probably have a lot to say on that topic, especially with, uh, I mean, that immediately makes me think about religion and how that impacts our society. Um, you know, with Christianity in particular, it's a very patriarchal, you know, system. And so I think that that the, the move away from religiosity has also impacted our cultural norms where everything comes in, uh, sexuality, love, relationships. Um, so would you like to expand on, on that? Well, I, I love that way of putting it, uh, Greg. We actually have con uh, layers of cultures on top of layers of cultures based upon when you were born, actually, in some ways, which kind of what you're saying. 
But then we can add another layer on the, I mean, that we haven't talked about that you're suggesting, Sonny, and that is, that is how, how religion is impacting this. And, and we've just gone through a period in our culture uh, in the 90s and the two, early 2000s where purity culture was rampant and people were being subjected to virtual sexual torture by, by the religions that they're born into, whether it's Jehovah's Witness or Baptist or Pentecostal, all those religions that are very dominant in our culture were, were forcing uh, their ideology into the private lives and psycho psychosocial development of, of young children. And what, I, I run an organization or help run an organization called Recover from Religion. And we have to deal with people calling us almost, I, I almost could say hourly, almost hourly, people calling us to talk about how religion fucked up their sex lives. And to broaden it a bit more, it didn't just fuck up their sex lives. It fucked up their ability to have relationships. There's a difference. You know, I think we jump to sex real quickly when we're talking about love, but there's a lot more to this notion of love. And that's why I don't like the word than, than just sex. And I've noticed in our discussion tonight, we keep jumping into sex and there's other things that we haven't mentioned. I mean, what I'm 71 years old. I don't have the sex drive I used to have but I still like sex. Don't get me wrong. It's just that other aspects of relationships have become much more important as I've grown older. And I think the way I was when I was 21 years old versus the way I was when I was 50 years old versus where I'm now, those are very different Daryl's. I mean, each, each of those age ages were a different person in some ways. And we're, we aren't talking about that as a culture. And I don't even see, I don't even see too much science, maybe, Mel or Greg has seen it, but I don't see much science telling us, you know, where, where does relationships and love and sexuality all come with respect to where you are in the life cycle? And I think that's kind of, in some ways, Greg, I think that's kind of where you're headed a little bit when you talk about a child being raised in a suburb right now, being subjected to their parents who were raised in a totally different sexual and relationship culture. There's a lot of conflict in in that in that cultural con, um, conflict configuration right now. I'm, I'm guessing. Anyway, I'll I'll uh, defer to the other two. Well, I I grew up Nazarene, so if you're familiar at all with that. Oh that hell was... yeah! <laughs> Na, 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 Mid America Nazarene College just down the street from me. Yeah. Oh pretty... my goodness! <laughs> they were trying to get me to go to Trevecca. Oh, <laughs> like, I, I, don't want to do I, I went to Scarrett College for Christian Workers in Nashville, Tennessee, where Trevecca oh, is. So I oh uh, rubbed gosh. shoulders with many Trevecca, Trevecca yeah. people. Yeah. I was brought up Nazarene, and that there's just it was so hyper patriarchal. Yeah, and you know, just as a personal aside, my dad was a music minister, and we had to change churches twice because of his infidelity. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, interesting that, oh, he's a great music minister. Ah, <laughs> apparently at other things, too, but whatever. <laughs> but it's terrible. It's terrible. We couldn't wear shorts um, that were, like, shorter than, like, our knees. They had, I went to Jesus camp. I went to that thing. It was just oh, yeah. crazy. Yeah. You know, um, my grandparents are still Nazarene. Being a woman's a disability. They don't understand how I got post-grad degrees in teaching chemistry. <laughs> they have no idea. And they keep like They're like, we knew you were smart. We didn't think you were that smart. So it's weird. It's, yeah. it's, it's weird. They're a completely different. Um, I, I don't want to say species, but they're a completely different time from me. And I'm just, you know, and I've been married before and they looked at me and they're like, what did you do to make him leave you? I said, <laughs> well, he wouldn't stop fucking people on the Internet, Grandma. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm not on the Internet. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I'm not a robot. So, and, I, and you know, but it was my fault that he left and I'm going, he wanted to fuck women on the internet. I mean, so it's weird. So yes, when you're talking about religion messes up your sex life and the way that you think, 
the the thing was Jesus others than yourself. Everybody else is more important than you. Everybody else is more important than your needs. And if you're a woman, the man is more important and you have to do everything that he wants to do, even if you don't want to do it yourself. So because you have to submit to him. You're a living example of what Greg just uh, mentioned. Yes, I think you are. You really are. Yes, I am. <laughs> I am. And that that was having to undo all of that in my head. That took some time. Yeah. <laughs> that took some time. And, you know, that uh, reminds me of a conversation I had. I don't know if they were Nazarene or not, but I remember uh, the person I was talking to was saying how he would go out and help this uh, older couple, like a uh, two women, they were sisters and they were living alone. Um, you know, they had survived everybody else. They were like 90 something. And so him and a bunch of his church people would go out to help them, you know, cut wood or repair the roof or whatever. And he said to me, and one thing was they would always make big, big meals, no matter what time of day it was, they'd make a big meal. And then they would say, you men go and sit and eat. The men were supposed to eat first. Yes. And then the the women would eat afterwards. Yep. And he was telling me this as if it was, you know, that was the day, you know, life was so much better back then. And look at how we were back. You know, he was, he was nostalgic for it. And I'm looking at him like you fucking ass. <laughs> the only way I could get out of church is with, is if we were having like some kind of food thing, like right after, my grandma was usually the money counter and then, you know, we would have to get food prepped. And so I was old enough and like, Oh, you can go with the ladies in the kitchen. I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't want to sit in this sermon. So like, <laughs> go high, tell it to the kitchen. What are we making today? Spaghetti. Great. And I would just sit there and watch them do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what, you know, I, I would probably do this. I enjoy cooking, but I'm not going to be demanded to. And by gosh, I'm hungry. I don't have, I am just as, as, you know, worthy of eating a damn potato is the next person. Um, there's nothing about the fact that they have a penis and I have a vagina. That means that I have to sit back and, and wait to eat. I just think it's ridiculous, but you just, sorry to kind of get off the, the subject a little <laughs> bit, but Greg, that does go back. It, that kind of hits on all of that hits on what you were just talking about with the cultural aspect and, and looking at those two uh, tribes that you were talking about. And I'm just curious, I wanted to, to go back there just for a quick second, because I was curious, in the study of those two, was religion a factor? Was their spirituality or, or the, their belief system a factor in how they were? Yes, in a sense that they were not Christianized. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a religion that, a religion, a, a, you know, there, there's a, a view among people who study major religions that the major religions are the legitimate religions. Like we've been talking entirely about Christianity. You think about the Abrahamic religions generally and just that set of religions. <clears throat> They're the, and the religions that come out of <clears throat> communities that have settled cities with a hierarchy and government, you know, that kind of stuff, like the Roman Empire, the Greeks, et cetera. Those major religions um, emerge as, as a social contract with morality and God. And that there is some, sp some God thing or multiple gods, et cetera. Uh, and that people without that have a quote, primitive religion in which they don't really have morals or ethics and they don't really have a much knowledge of their religion. One, one religious expert gave a talk here at the University of Minnesota. Actually, it was a debate between him and PZ Myers, I think. And he talked about how the origin of religion involves people living in hunter-gatherer societies kind of bumping into each other literally and accidentally some guy looks at some other guy's wife funny and then they kind of say we better have a rule and that's sort of the primitive so what would these folks have and i don't know about the people the one group that i lived with i know something about their belief system and it is a it is not something that they that's not primitive it's not simple um people have lived with this group of people over a decade of time continuously and almost no one can describe their belief system it's so rich and complex and complicated. I've read every word written about pygmies in two languages, three languages, and uh, there's no consistency in understanding by anthropologists or explorers or anyone else across them. 
It's incredibly rich, complex, and detailed, and it permeates every single thing they do every moment of the day. They're not religious at all. <laughs> okay, but whether or not an insect has a certain meaning, or a plant has a certain meaning, or practices a certain meaning, or a food way has a certain meaning, is just they're just drenched in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. As, but it doesn't it doesn't drive their day to day moral and ethical decisions. Those are based upon something else they have, which is interesting morals and ethics and they make great hum humanists you know they understand ethics and morals come from our society meanwhile that insect don't crush it it will affect your fertility because we have this belief that we've added to our belief system but there's not an ethic or the, the, the religion that they have what you would call a religion that this does not does not provide them with ethical or moral guidance they get that from ethics and morals Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It feels like it touches a little bit on chaos theory, you know, <laughs> just a little smidgen. Your singular act can affect other oh, things the, down the line. Yeah. You know? The whole thing with insects and, and fertility, you know, they're, they're, uh, in, in the Aturi forest, the, there's a, a it's, it's part of the, the great African, so-called African fertility, be, infertility belt. So the fertility rates of people in that area are just are really low, typically. So people are really obsessed with fertility. So okay. a, a lot of stuff gets linked into fertility. So uh, that, and it kind of it's pretty straightforward. It kind of explains a lot of things. But it is again, it isn't something that drives people's day to day decisions so much. There's rules you follow, mm -hmm. and the, the rules tend to make sense. But but that's not. It, I guess what I'm saying is that there, if you look at the, like the idea that the women wait, make the food and the men eat it by themselves. Why is that in a Christian religion? Well, there are specific verses, if you ask someone in the Bible, that they will quote you as to why you do that, even if that never happened in real life in Jesus' time mm -hmm. or whatever. It, it's, there's, a, there's a Bible quote that tells you why. There's nothing in the, in the hunter-gatherer religions that I know of that informs people of day-to-day -day ethical or moral decisions. They get their ethics and morals because they are people that know that they live in a society where they need to have ethics and morals. Mm -hmm. I'd like to piggyback on on what you said a little bit earlier, Greg. And uh, when I wrote my book, Sex and God, I spent probably the first third of the book talking about those kind of cultures. And my contention was, let's look at cultures before pre-contact, before they were contacted, before they were polluted by Islam, before they were polluted by Christianity, before they were polluted by Judaism, even, and or Hinduism. But Hinduism is a very patriarchal. In many ways, as many of the same problems that Christianity does. But if you can find some cultures or find reliable data on those cultures, you'll find their sexuality is radically different than what Christian sexuality is or Mormon sexuality. And so that led me to, to hypothesize that we have, we have religions. We have Mormon sexuality. We have Baptist sexuality. We have Islamic sexuality. None of those sexualities look like the sexuality of somebody who wasn't polluted by those cultures. Uh, an Amazonian tribe that believes in part of all paternity, for example, that I think Greg may have been re relating to. So there's, or the Mangadian culture in, in, in South in South Pacific, where there's uh, seems to be a pretty, women seem to drive the sex, the sexual act. Um, and I'm not saying that there's not, variations on that theme and all those cultures, of course. But there's a lot of, there's a lot to be learned by, by trying to understand what humans would be if they hadn't been polluted by one of these patriarchal cultures. And there's some pretty nasty uh, non-Western cultures out there that, you know, treat, treat women even worse or hurt, uh, you know, other things like gentle mutilation and stuff that, and they got that long before Western contact came along. I'm not saying pre-contact cultures are better or worse. I'm just saying they're very different. And so that opens us up to ask the question, what is human sexuality? And it's not necessarily tied to any culture. We could see that there's, there's practices that span the entire gamut of, of massive possibilities of human sexuality. If you look at all different cultures, but if you just look at Christian cultures or Western patriarchal cultures, it's very limited. It's nothing like what it could be. And I think that's what we're starting to see right now. I think we're seeing people explore other sexualities. 
explore other options. I mean, the fact that people can be out and openly gay, that couldn't be, I mean, it couldn't be done in the 40s and 50s. People can talk openly about being polyamorous. That couldn't have been done even 20 years ago. So there's explorations of new sexualities that have in fact been practiced by other cultures already. It's nothing new. It's it's just that we're bringing it in and looking at it and exploring with it a little bit. Curious what you think about that, Greg, uh, or or Mel. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, one quick reaction, even within, say, Western Amer- in American culture, um, if 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 the average, you know, educated, reasonably educated American person interested in the social sciences and history, reads the writings contemporary with Abraham Lincoln, including his own and others at the time. There's a, an interesting debate emerged, which is, is it the case that all the men in Abraham Lincoln's time who were lawyers and professionals of various kinds were gay? Because if you look at <laughs> what they say and what they do, they're loving each other and they're sleeping in the same bed every night and they're just totally 100% gay by any modern standard. Now, other people looked at it and said, well, no, they weren't gay, but they had they were, things were different. And the idea that, that four or five men would sleep in the same bed was because there was only one bed and they were, you know, whatever. And, and the way people talked about each other, I mean, and use the worst, their use of the word love and the way that they talk about relationships. You, th- there's a perfectly good explanation for this, give it, looking at it from a purely modern perspective, which is that they were all gay or bisexual. Another possibility is that they lived in a different time. And we don't understand their language or their behavior, even though, even though, I mean, I, I have told this story before in this, in, this, in this context. I once, when I was a kid, met a man who was born when he was a slave. And he had a vague memory in his life of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. So one generation later, if I exaggerate greatly, we have this vast difference in how people use these words and, and relate. And I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. Maybe they were all gay. I just really don't know. Um, uh, it's it, it, the, our, what we call gay today is not a, a term that has the same meaning, probably mm-hmm. in 1850s and 1840s and 1830s. Mm-hmm. So, it, so even within our own historically documented culture, not only is there a variation, but we don't understand the variation. That's, that's exactly correct. That's, oh my gosh, I am so digging this. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to take a few questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one is from Kathy Humanist. How is infatuation different than love? I think Y'all infatuation, don't, don't <laughs> I, I think infatuation is a bit more lust driven um, and perhaps you're getting some of the feels that you would feel associated with love as what might could be, uh, but it's not necessarily, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the same thing as love, um, but you might get, I mean, it's messy, so you might see something in a person that you saw in another person and you loved them and that's firing off those neurons. Um, I don't know. That's been kind of my experience. If I was infatuated with someone, there was something there that would trigger those little heart flutters that you feel when, when you're in love with somebody. But I find that it fades a little bit. If you start to engage with them and you see maybe they're not, who you thought you had in your head. So but that's, that's my view on that. So, so more like a, the difference between fantasy and reality in a sense. A bit. Well, I, I think there's another question. What's the difference between infatuation and, and obsession? Ooh, that's so a good we, one. Yeah. So we can look, I, I challenge you to go on the radio and listen to any pop song any pop song and you'll hear that about 50 percent of them or more are espousing some pretty crazy ideas about what love is and it sounds a lot more like obsession i need you i have to have you you are mine you belong to me i mean think how many songs contain those very words or something similar to them 
And then you get into country music and it's even worse there. I mean, God damn, that's the worst <laughs> shit you'll ever come across. Or get into opera and find out people get murdered over, you know, their infatuation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, uh, I, I, I like opera. So I, I, I like to study the crazy psychology of opera. <laughs> Wagnerian opera can be rather crazy. And of course, Shakespeare was full of people getting murdered because they were infatuated with each other. So these um, things, but but the fun the fun thing is to follow up on what we were talking about earlier. These the, the definitions of all these things have changed, and they've changed dramatically, to the point that the n word "gay" used to be mean you're happy, and now it means you're you you know you have a sexual orientation that's not hetero. You know, so there's it's flipped, and there's lots of words that are flipping like that. And love used to be, I mean, look look at at um, Romeo and Juliet. Look how many times they're using the word love between two kids that probably haven't known each other, <laughs> you know, hard, hardly days and they're all, and they're committing suicide, you know? Um, yeah. It's a bit <laughs> of an overreaction, I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. a little bit. Um, I do want to hey, point it's out. It's sold pretty well over the last three or four centuries. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point out something that, that I, I had really quick. Um, that there was a song called Open Your Heart by Madonna. I love that song. It was so cute. I'm like, open your heart. I'll make you love me. Well, for whatever reason, one day Amazon Music put on a picture of a rap dude while this song is going on. And I'm going, you know, if a guy were to sing this song, it would take a totally different and creepy turn. <laughs> you know? I'll make you love me. It's not that I see you on the street and you walk on by. You make me want to hang my head down and cry. I've had to work much harder than this. And I'm like, gosh, if a dude sang this, it would be so wrong. So it's just like, I get it with the, with the stalkery music. Yeah. Stalkery That's a good point that. though. That infatuation is a form of love that is best translated into song or theater. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it just isn't going to play. Yeah. This isn't that interesting. Otherwise, it's literary fiction that's kind of boring, but we pretend we like it. Yeah. yeah. Right. One thing we have not talked about or mentioned, and that is the notion of romance and romantic love. And that is a gigantic myth that is perpetuated throughout our culture, throughout our literature, throughout our music. And I think it has the potential to be a dangerous myth because it puts forth an idea that is simply unrealistic. You are mine forever. We will be in love forever. That somehow we were made for each other, that we are soulmates. I mean, think of all the things I just mentioned, you could probably name a dozen more, and they all comp are a component of the mythology around romance. That word has not even been used tonight up, up to this minute, as far as I can tell. That's quite so interesting. I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just interested that we haven't mentioned that, but anyway, that's... Well, I, you know, when, when I think of that, I also think about how um, when you think of romance and that type of love, if you will, it's almost like your identity, your entire identity is wrapped up in this other person. Oh, and I yep. think that that was yeah. something that we used to strive for uh, culturally, especially women. Um, that Weddings, are, bridezillas. Yeah. I used to work in wedding planning. I have oh. stories. Oh, oh wow. My God. <laughs> Oh my God. I never wanted a wedding after I planned them. I'm like, this is a nightmare. These people just, this is my day. This has got to be perfect. I have to float down the aisle with wings and doves or and I'm just like, my God. And what does any of that have to do with the actual marriage? Not a damn thing. It's a show. It's, <laughs> it's a show and it's money. It's, it's uh, our, it's well, most cultures have something along with marriage, but I almost feel like ours is so tied up with the uh, capitalist type system that anyway, and I know yeah. that kind of goes off on another subject, but my gosh, you're so right. I, I just think that like we were talking about before with moving towards some type of a healthy uh, attachment to another person or, or not attachment, but um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? relationship that's not the word i was looking for but i'll use that root word um trying to have a, a more uh, healthy relationship where we recognize now that our entire identity does not necessarily have to be tied up with the other person that i can have a an identity the other person can have an identity 
and a third person or whatever you have going on can have their own identities and how we are linking them up and trying to create some type of a mutual uh, agreement in a sense, you know, where we all get something, get what we want out of that and, and become fulfilled from that relationship instead of tying mm-hmm. everything up. And if um, I, I even have a, a, uh, Someone that uh, confided in me that even saying something negative about her husband makes her feel very uncomfortable, even though for the last two decades, he's been gaslighting and narcissistic. Even admitting that to another person is like, what have I done? Even speaking the words out loud to Mm -hmm. a, a stranger or to someone that it will never, you know, will never impact is almost like what have I done now to him? I'm being almost unfaithful to him. I'm being untrue mm-hmm. to him mm-hmm. because that you become wrapped up in what it means to be married, not necessarily what it means to be in a relationship with that person. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I think it's important again, going at the logical again on you guys. Um, it's important to distinguish between uh, a personal relationship between two people and marriage and I think in our society, we tend to see them as being kind of the same thing, mm-hmm. but it really varies. And so you'll talk about, you know, we had this concept of the past, the Western mm-hmm. version of the past, um, which might be the 1920s or might be the 19th century or whatever. And in, in kind of middle class Western past, uh, marriages lasted lifetimes and for a lot of people, or the, that was the ideal. But um, in people, but, but that did not mean that personal relationships lasted lifetimes. Marriages were were an edifice that people participated in and acknowledged, but uh, personal relationships were not linked. Usually the first few years would be linked to the marriage, but then they would go different directions. And and people would have multiple affairs with other people within the context of a sort of Victorian or early 19th century, or 20, or early 20th century marriage system. You couldn't divorce, especially depending on your religion context. You couldn't divorce, but you'd have... So we look at people like the royal families and see what they do. And okay, that's what everybody else is doing too, but just with mm-hmm. way fewer castles. Okay. <laughs> and, and their mistress a, a, a up in a house <laughs> in yeah. the city. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's gonna lose themselves a trailer. But um <laughs> but if, if, if you look at if you look at the divorce rate among modern Americans starting in like the 80s or 90s when it wasn't possible to have a single earner anymore, <clears throat> look at the divorce rate, it went up. It's still high, and compared to the divorce rate among hunter gatherers, it's about the same. And in both cases, it's individuals, you know, following scarce resources across vast landscapes. And your marriage only works when it's working as a personal, economic, household, mm-hmm. child rearing relationship. One hundred percent, all those things have to be working, or your marriage doesn't really work. So you just get a different marriage. Okay, and that's, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm trivializing that, but that's what people actually, in fact, do. Mm-hmm. Well, that's okay? the Hadza. You're describing the Hadza, as I understand it. Well, I'm describing Americans. Yeah, Hadza, absolutely. Hadza and Bushman, yeah. very much mm-hmm. Bushman. And and uh, the data I'm referring to are from the Hadza and, 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 and Bushman groups, for example. But whereas if you're a Victorian English family, um, you cannot do that because your household resources are based upon your marriage. Yeah. And and you cannot break that. And, and you can have whatever relationships you want. That marriage doesn't go anywhere. It stays there the whole time. So what the marriage is is different. But there's another thing, a little discussion going on in the chat, I think is really interesting. How would we how would we uh, think about marriage and relationships and obsession and love if we included our pets? Like how many people <laughs> divorce their dog? You you love your dog until one of you dies. Oh God! It, it really uh-huh. is a romantic thing, right? It, it's it's a romantic ideal. You pick the dog out. You it's love at first sight. You go to the pound. The dog looks at you. You look at the dog. You go home with the dog, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, no, I have to shoot that down a little bit. There was a high rate of people returning their dogs to the pound when they had to start working again. Well, and those it are, really sucks. Yes. Yeah, and it really I sucked though. That. But people didn't yeah. want to do that. I right? hope not. Well, they shouldn't have dogs to begin with, probably. But a good healthy. In my opinion, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a good healthy pet relationship. People tend to have like a better, longer, more consistent relationship with their pet. 
And they I don't know. I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of neurotic <laughs> pets with neurotic humans. So sometimes yeah, that, they go together. Yeah, right. But I've <laughs> also seen I've also seen the dog being like a kid. They they uh, when the marriage breaks up, then they're fighting right. over who has custody oh, yeah. of the dog, and mm-hmm. even have visitation rights. It's all written up into right. their agreement. And who's going to pay doggy support and all this kind of yeah. stuff and. So yeah, I think you're you're very right. I have another question I want to get to from the audience, and this is from back, uh, Black Female Atheist. What guidance would you offer to a person to come out of their fear of finding love and being loved post deconversion? I think that's a great question. I think uh, Daryl, I'm going to go to you first because of <laughs> because of the work that you do in particular, and then move to the others. Okay. Yeah, I saw a target on my back. It flashed before <laughs> my face. You all saw the same target on your back. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there it is. Uh, the, the need the need for our social support is immense when people leave religion because you. I saw somebody up here earlier say you play a music country music song backwards. You get your wife back, you get your dog back, get your house back. That's an old joke. I, I've I've told that joke for years. But the, the thing about leaving religion is you lose your dog, you lose your house, you lose your social support, and you lose your family. The list of things you lose when you leave is immense. So the one of the first tasks it appears to me when, when somebody leaves is to reestablish as 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 soon as possible, but also as healthily as possible, a new social a social structure, a new social system around themselves. And that includes finding partners. I'm not saying mates. I'm not saying somebody you're going to marry. Don't don't jump out of religion and run find somebody to marry. That would be uh, that would be a disaster probably. But it is difficult to replace all that. I mean, religions have had thousands of years to create very well structured social systems for support and to maintain you in their, you know, inside themselves. So if somebody's having trouble finding it, there's, you live in the internet age. I'm telling, I'm saying to the person who asked the question, there are so many ways to connect with people now that didn't exist 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. And you can, for, for example, you can chat in a, to an organization called recovering from religion and ask, where might there be a group for me to join or, you can get online and there's agnostics.com, which is a dating site for atheists and agnostics. So you can find people in your community that don't believe in Jesus and uh, don't want to have a threesome with Jesus. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I like to say that if you're married and you're a Christian marriage, then you're having a threesome with Jesus every time you have sex because Jesus is watching you, right? So I don't know what, the, the ultimate answer is I know I know the journey is there and I know there's people here to help. So my my response to your question, Sonny, or that person's question is chat with us, call us, look at our resources, look at the groups. There are so many resources that didn't exist even 10 years ago. We can help you. And I, I really want I really mean that we have got people ready to help you right now if you call or, or chat in and we will not ask you for any money. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, another uh, thing that I was thinking of, uh, you know, I deal with child maltreatment, child abuse and that kind of thing. And uh, so, so on my staff, I have therapists who are trauma focused. They mm-hmm. do uh, what's called trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy and or TFCBT for short and uh, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that I know that the therapist would say is, Uh, instead of worrying about the love part, worry about uh, finding who you are and finding acceptance of you without the religion, Mm -hmm. because your your, uh, entire identity and self-worth was tied up in the religion, just like we talked about before with the identity uh, being tied up with your spouse, especially for for women in the past. It's also your your entire identity. When you go through that deconversion process, you're giving up the entire foundation of how you saw you in the world. And so um, maybe before you try to worry about about that finding love part, it's the second part, the being lovable and being lovable to yourself, first and foremost, um, dealing with the deconversion and the identity crisis that you're going through 
And then when you're healthy with that, then start working on the finding love and being and, and allowing someone else to love you because you're not going to be healthy until you can love your own self. And I, I mean, I hear the therapist standing next to me saying, this is what you need to say. So I wanted to just kind of add that. And now I'll, uh, I'd like to go on to our other two panelists, um, Mel and Greg, do either of you have more to add on that topic? Um, I, I was actually thinking therapist as well. Uh, I, um, I didn't, you know, so I'm not religious now. I don't really talk about my personal belief system or anything like that. I'm not Nazarene. <laughs> I was Catholic for a little while. I've been Baptist. I even did some Santeria, had an altar and everything. That was pretty fun. Uh, but when you leave religion, uh, it's weird because I was brought up in the Nazarene faith. And if you didn't pray every night before you went to sleep, if you died in your sleep, you would go to hell. <laughs> I mean, you might have committed a sin and you have to ask for forgiveness every single night. So your entire, yes, your entire identity is centered around that. And like I said before, Jesus, others, and then yourself, your self-care, you don't have that. Other people are more important than you. And being a woman, you're at the bottom of the rung. The kids are more important than you. The men are more important than you. Everybody else is more important than you. I, you know, I still go to therapy every once in a while to try to undo everything that's been programmed in my head that tells me you're not good enough. You know, you, you didn't pray today. Uh, you know, maybe if you pray to God just this one time, you might get what you want. Um, even getting my my um, science degrees, I went back as an adult to complete my education. People would come up to me and be like, wow you know, you must have a guardian angel taking all those tests for you. I'm like, no, I studied my butt off. How <laughs> dare you? This was before I even like left religion. I'm like, no, you don't know that this is the crying semester. Okay. Biochem, genetics, physics, physics lab, undergrad research. I'm like, you have no, this is the cry organic chemistry, the previous semester. Oh my God. The fact I made it out of that not having chemistry in 20 years blows my mind. <laughs> in fact, an angel's watching over you. I wanted to punch them in the face. <laughs> I'm like, angels didn't take my test. So trying to realize that your self-worth <clears throat> is so important. You're not just a thing. You're not just a vessel. You're not just a baby maker. You're not supposed to be pregnant in the kitchen. Have your grandparents telling you they didn't think you were this smart. I mean, it's all of that is part of it. So it's really important to, to find who you are in all of that. I, I can't stress that enough. Man, religion gave me so much anxiety and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I had sleep paralysis and they told me, I was like my house was was infested with demons and I needed to sleep with a Bible under my pillow. I had sleep paralysis. That's what it was. Didn't learn that. So I was an adult. <laughs> so it's like that was their response. So, yes, I agree with with the therapy thing. And maybe um, Dr. Ray has some resources for that, too. Yes, yes. And I, I want to add to what you just said, because I think religion really fucks with your attachment systems. I mean, think of all the things you were taught going through childhood, through adolescence about relationships and almost everything you're taught from any patriarchal religious standpoint is wrong. It's just biologically wrong for one. And if, and if it creates anxiety around how you create a relationship, you're not going to lose that just because you leave the religion. So we see a lot of people trying to figure out how do I have an, how do I have a relationship? I was taught all my life. I can't have one unless it's with a Christian can't have a Christian husband. I have to have a Christian wife or whatever. And I'm gay. So that really screws up with, you know, whatever. So I'm just, so I think the main thing I want to emphasize is if you get out, don't jump into a relationship real quick, try and find out who you are. I'm just repeating what you both have already said, but realize that your attachment, the, the methodology of attachment may need to be examined deeply and a good therapist can really help you understand that and tailor it to you and what your uh, what your brain ne needs 
Absolutely. And Recovering from Religion is an excellent resource for that. Absolutely. I would totally uh, agree. <laughs> and Greg, do you have, uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? I don't have much to add to all that great advice, except to just note that probably where you live, there's a secular community. And my advice with that is there's probably more than one secular community. And, and don't just pick one. Explore all of them because they're they're flawed they have advantages they're different they also evolve over time and become part of it and change it and make it make it better and um, you know and just if my rule of thumb is if someone if it's an atheist thing over here and a humanist thing over here I recommend heading for the humanists first because humanists have the added benefit of trying to not be assholes whereas atheists <laughs> don't care <laughs> So Richard Dawkins. I said it out loud, I'm sorry. But, Richard uh, Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but that's but, you're you're right. But where you live, where you live, your community is gonna I mean there's a subset of the atheist community, for example, in Twin Cities, which is really great. And and those also are usually members of also the humanist community here too. And so and they have they try to fill in as many of those things that in life that religion and patriarchy gives you. Like you could get together and eat, but everyone could eat at the same time. And, you know, and there's no God and stuff. So they, 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 there are communities that do that. I think that's a good, just a good general idea to just find your community and explore it. We have, a, or, we have an organization. It's a national organization called Oasis. Uh, we have the second of those chapters here in Kansas City. And we have a large membership. And if when COVID's not around, we have 100 to 150 people showing up every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock to hear a good speaker. And uh, we're online now, of course. But the reason I mentioned that is that uh, we've had uh, we've been going now for seven years, and I I think I, I know at least five couples who met each other through Oasis and are now married, uh, and I know a number more, many more than that have met people and have dated, you know, in whatever format they want. But it's really interesting. There are communities where people are coming together, much like churches do. They're meeting people of like mind, and they're moving into long term relationships. And there's Sunday Assembly out there, Unitarian Churches, the Ethical Society. There's a lot of groups that have been around for decades, maybe a century even. But new people coming out of church don't realize that there's so many of these groups. Mm -hmm. And I do advise the same thing that Greg says. Be discriminating in which groups you join because some aren't, just won't fit you. And again, we can help you find that group. You chat in with us. Tell us what you want. We will get on. We will. I guarantee you within five minutes, we'll probably have you connected with a half a dozen, half a dozen groups that are probably within 50 miles of your house. I'm going to uh, hit you up on that offer because I live in the ass crack of Trumpster land. <laughs> you we, too. we have we have more of the south than we seem to have anywhere else <laughs> oh my god well i i want to see if you can find something within 50 miles of my house because i would love that okay. my uh I, I just want to say for, for me um where i live in one county work in another county and both of them are as I, there's some good stuff with them but holy shit i'm so tired of big trucks spewing black smoke with the Trump on one side and a Confederate flag on the other thinking that, you know, what the hell? Anyway, I would really love to have something. <laughs> this right here is my self care is talking to people like you. Um, it, but, you know, we all need that. And so you may not be able to find a brick and mortar place or a meetup necessarily. I mean, depending on where you are, but you will always have this. You will have people, you know, content on um on youtube which you would think what but you really can get something from it you can find that community and and eat, you know all of us have had to learn how to change the way that we socialize because of covid and this is another thing that we can be doing and then you know figure out ways to have those meetups and that sort of thing I, so i, I Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to throw something out. There's a lot of parallel with what we're talking about with recovery from religion and being a former high school teacher in the Bible Belt, teaching biology and evolution. I know what they teach these kids out here. There is a genuine pain that they feel, particularly with the ones that do have critical thinking skills when you show them the evidence of evolution. And honestly, if you're if you're a person and you're not religious and you're talking to a religious person and you know that they got the critical thinking there, that aftercare for them 
to say, hey, I just want to make certain you understand what these words are. I'm not going to make you believe this. I'm not going to make you do anything. I just, you know, and I'm here. I'm your friend. That made all the difference in the world to those kids, knowing that I'm not going to force them to believe something. I just wanted them to understand what it was. But you could see one of the smartest kids I ever had in my class. She, she, you could see the pain in her face because she had to come to the realization that somebody lied to her. Mm -hmm. Is it the nice science teacher that's telling her that I believe in you? Or is it her church and her family? And that's extremely painful. Um, trying to discuss those hard topics with people of faith. Uh, so just being a little ounce of kindness can actually help somebody steadily make that journey to understanding themselves a bit better in the world around them, you know? Absolutely. The pain, it's, the pain, it's the pain of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is real. And it's, it could even be life-threatening because people commit suicide over some mm -hmm. of these things. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get that help that you need. I want to be uh, aware of everybody's time. You guys have taken time out of your evening. And I know we've already gone over, but we've... It's been such a valuable conversation and we've gone into directions I didn't even realize we were going to go into, but I think it was very much needed. And I think we could probably go on about two more hours if we wanted to. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to be um, you know, aware of y'all's time and, and be cognizant of that. So what I'd like to do is, um, is highlight each of you, first of all. Um, what do you have going on, Mel? What, what's some of the things that are coming up? Oh, boy. Uh, well... I am currently, uh, I'm really busy with work. <laughs> I'm trying my best to not be so busy. Uh, we've transitioned from online classes to in-person and dealing with the fears associated with that with students coming back to class, smaller class sizes, which is okay. But um, I've, I'm working on um, a, a project. I'm hoping to get some grant funding within a year or so for uh, STEM mentoring for students that are, uh, the college I teach 70% are in poverty line. So it's largely marginalized students. So I'm working on that to try to help develop this mentoring um, program to help these students you know, have some support when they're starting out in college. I'm also working on open education resources for chemistry through openstacks.org. Hopefully I'll get a grant for that too. Don't know that they'll give it to me, but I'm going to try. Uh, but I'll be making content for that anyway. So if you'd like to brush up your chemistry, your general chemistry knowledge. I'll be generating videos associated with a completely free textbook in coordination with online simulations readily available for you. Now, if you want to do labs, man, you're going to have to sort that out. I'd say cooking probably be a good thing. <laughs> but at home, if you're wanting to go back over and refresh your brain on these concepts, I'll be um, doing that on my channel as well. And then I have my show on Saturday mornings, The Science Of, where we talk about sciencey things and sometimes we touch on different social issues. Excellent. Um, by the way, you have an, a wonderful YouTube channel. It's it. I love the you. you have different, you know, different things. It's not just like all one thing and all just you talking some, you know, you have all different types of things going on. And I think it's just fantastic. It makes science uh, and chemistry and that sort of thing. It, interesting. And <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you always learn something. So I, I love your channel. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for what you do. Uh, Greg, what do you have going on? Sure. Mel's, science, Mel's YouTube channel is great. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm working on a couple of top secret writing projects. But other than that, um, what I've been doing lately and I'm, I'm upping my game on now is I'm living in the on the frontier in a sense. If you look at a map, those maps of the United States that show red versus blue counties. OK, I'm on the edge of that blue zone. In the last four years, we've turned our districts here blue and we've made our state so much more blue and i'm going to be working on that um literally you know finding places working on campaigns and and at the same time working on uh environmental issues mainly climate change related issues and that's where some of the writing projects are also excellent excellent oh very good 
our producer in the background <laughs> pulling up your your book, Atheist Voices of Minnesota. Excellent. Yeah, that's kind of a fun book. It's basically a volume of people who are atheists in Minnesota. And Minnesota is one of those frontiers areas also. Mm -hmm. It's kind of religious here, but the religions are mostly not intense, freaky religions. They're just everybody's religious here. And so you really notice it. So just a bunch of people who aren't religious wrote a book and each one of us is telling the story about how we ended up finding out that we're actually atheists. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you for your, for all the hard work that you do and congratulations on working so hard for change, you know, to change your uh, districts and even your state uh, blue. We, we desperately need that in the age of Trumpster dumpster land. So thank you for your hard work. And uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, next is you. I'd really like to know. I know you are always busy, so I'm almost uh, afraid yeah. to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I got to list that long. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have going on? Well, first of all, I would say in response to this topic tonight, if you really want to know a lot, uh, I, and I, I'm just pumping it personally, is that go read my book, Sex and God. How Religion Distorts Sexuality. I think if you read that, it may help you identify some of the issues inside of your own psyche that you may need to work on. I've had people say I've been an atheist for 30 years. I read that book. I didn't know I was still being affected by the shit I was grown up with. Second thing is, uh, we haven't really mentioned it, but we have the Secular Therapy Project. I think we mentioned a little bit earlier. If you need a therapist, you need to find one that will not send you back to church, will not say your depression is because you're an atheist. Go to seculartherapy.org. It's, it's a simple process to register and then try and find a therapist near you, hopefully within your own state so you can do online stuff or maybe go visit them personally. We have 438 therapists registered and vetted by us. We know they are evidence-based. We know they're well-trained and we know they're licensed. So you can find somebody. We've got uh, 500, 538 and we've got over 27,000 people who've registered with us to find clients. So we know it works and we know you can find somebody. Go get the help you need through through uh, our system. Our system free too. Everything we do at Recovery from Religion is free. Now you do have to pay the therapist because that's a private service, but we'll help you find the therapist for free. Uh, next is every Monday night. I'm actually not on Recovery from Religion X, RFRX we call it tonight, because of you, Sonny. I sacrificed just for you. <laughs> Normally, I would be there, and tonight we had an incredibly good talk by Dr. Andy Thompson, a psychiatrist, on uh, addiction and how the brain works and all. Every Monday night, we have a great talk by some, usually an expert, and Greg, we might be interested in talking to you about that, by the way. Uh, pull, pull, and Mel, we're always looking for science stuff, so why don't you two put yourselves on our list, because I think uh, we're out. We're we're booked out about uh, three four months, but we could get you on in July, January, or or February probably. Both Sounds of great. you. I'm, I'm serious. We we would probably like a good talk from either one of you. And then we and we have it on a YouTube channel, so you can come on the Rick our RFR YouTube channel, and you can see any of our talks going back for almost two years. And last and maybe not least is I, I am an advocate for really healthy sexuality, in in, in every way, shape, or form. And one of the things I keep hearing is so many people come out of religion with the idea that there is such a thing as sexual addiction or porn addiction. And I just want people to realize there's no such thing. Get out there and do some research. Watch my YouTubes. Read David Lay's book on the myth of sex addiction. I can give you all sorts of, and you can find these resources either on your own or you can go to Recovering from Religion. They'll help you get them. But uh, too many people are being hurt by this crazy Christian idea of religious addiction there's no diagnosis for it there's no evidence there's no science so um it's it's painful when i hear atheists saying i'm a sex addict i say fuck you're not a sex addict <laughs> you're a christian addict maybe but you're not a sex addict all right i could go on and on but i'll leave i'll let you go sunny okay thank you um thank you so much for all the work that you do dr ray we um we live in a better world because of the work that you have done with um the Secular Therapy Project, um, and um, and your work with the uh, Recovering from Religion, and those are vastly, vastly beneficial to so many people. So thank you for the impact that you've had in the real world. Um, so I'll tell you, uh, for you guys, 
Uh, if you want to check out uh, the Tang channel, uh, Wednesday, I am doing a show on, uh, it's part two of a show on child maltreatment and the effects of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, so uh, please check that out. Check out our first episode, which aired uh, not this past Wednesday, but the Wednesday before. Uh, but here on uh, PSF, we have other great shows. Uh, check us out. Um, and also remember, we have a, a Patreon account. So if you would like to support us, check out our Patreon account. Uh, you can also become a member here on YouTube. We have some benefits to that. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, share, hit the bell, all those good things. Um, and make sure and, and think about all of the great content that we've had tonight with these wonderful people. Uh, we've had some amazing information from multiple different perspectives. If you need some assistance, again, check out Recovering from Religion or the Secular Therapy Project or your own therapist. I would recommend not going with a religious therapist because that can be very harmful. If you want to continue this discussion and if anyone on the panel would like to, we have our Discord and you can definitely check out the Discord link um, and continue the conversation there. Uh, in the meantime, I want everyone to have a wonderful week and I hope you've recovered from your Halloween. Good night, everybody. <laughs>